All right, people, come on. I need a little enthusiasm. Come on. This is, this is the one time where this room's going to be louder than next door. We can do this. I believe we can. So I'm so excited about this. This is something we did in New York, too. These are the celebrity dashboards. These dashboards are so great, they should be famous. They should be like movie stars. So we have Nerd Life sunglasses in the back for you so you can live the nerd life with us. Um, I'm so glad these customers have agreed to share dashboards. It was nice to hear in the keynote this morning. We really don't want to build shelfware. We want to build something that you guys can do amazing things with. And that's already happening. So that's why we're going to share it with you. So I'm so excited. We have four customers. Um, and on the first two, you're going to be able to tweet and share it. And the second two will ask you not. So the cool thing is you're here and you're in the room and you'll get to see stuff that other people won't. But you totally understand why some of these dashboards they wouldn't want out because they have private business information. So are we ready? Come on. There we go. That's better. All right, so as I said, for these first two customers, photograph all you want to, tweet, Vine, video, whatever your so favorite social media is, and we'll go first. So Eric Hawkins, who's the Director of Engineering at Appfolio, is going to come on up and share his dashboards with us. Eric, where are you? I'm right here. All right, in the house. Come on, Eric. All right, let's get this up on screen. Um, so, so I'm going to bring up th this dashboard right away. And uh, I didn't prepare any slides, anything like that. But I'm, I'm going to try and um, sort of set the stage here, give you a little bit of context for what we're looking at. And then, um, and then we'll start kind of going through the dashboard and talk about what questions it answers and sort of how it evolved over time and things like that. So um, again, as Tori mentioned, my name is Eric. I'm director of engineering at Appfolio. We build property management software. Well, we have a few different products, but that's the product that I work on. Um, so we've been using Insights for quite a while. I think we, we were beta customers, so we've been using it however long it's been around, two years, something like that. So we have a lot of dashboards that have built up over time. Um, and so when I was asked to do this, I was thinking about, okay, what's a, what's a good dashboard that sort of hits a lot of different concerns? It has like an operational component, a product development component, uh, user experience, a quality assurance, and even even a business component. So I think that this dashboard kind of has a little bit of all that. Um, and so what it is, okay, so we're in the property management software business. And so who here has ever rented an apartment? Yeah, okay, I would hope that there's uh, a lot of hands up, right? So you're familiar with the domain. Everybody's f familiar with the domain. And when you rent an apartment or when you're going to move in, one of, the, one of the things that the property manager or the owner has to do is inspect the the unit inspect the property before transitioning it so they can like give the deposit back to the previous tenant and get it into good repair for the subsequent tenant right okay so that inspection process is labor intensive it involves people being out in the field traditionally with like a clipboard and a checklist and a camera right and so we wanted to build something um, for our customers that could facilitate the whole inspection process and okay, so that's what this dashboard is about. It's about us building a feature for our customers called inspections or mobile inspections, which let them inspect units in the field. Okay, so a little bit more context. So we're thinking about building this and like every great product, it starts with a hallway conversation with the ops team, right? Like, hey, we're thinking about building this service and it might have a, a ton of photo uploads. How are we looking in terms of like storage and web server capacity? And you kind of met with a blank stare, right? Like, how can I possibly answer that question? Are we talking about like 10 photos a minute? Or are we talking about 10 million photos a minute? Like, it's, it matters. So, hence, this type of dashboard. So we went into it very analytics first, right? And instrumented the feature from the get-go. So fundamental question we needed to answer quickly was how many photos are going to be attached to each one of these inspections that are created in the field? So th this product's been around for a little while now. So you can see here um, on the left, sort of just 
the growth in usage of the feature, right, of how many inspections are created over time. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the correlation of inspections versus the number of images and the number of customers over time, right? And so we needed to establish that baseline, which formed pretty quickly of, it's it, on average about 20 photos per inspection are gonna be uploaded, right? And, and we learned that really quickly because we, we built like a really simple offering, got it out to some beta customers, we had the analytics in, and then we could provision infrastructure, we could like be ready to go. So that, you know, that, that was pretty huge for the success of this thing. And um, yeah, so, what, so this is kind of the, the overall trajectory and growth in terms of adoption. And in the early days, we were mostly just iterating fast on the product, trying to get it to stick, make sure that like the, the customers were actually using it. Um, and so that was kind of how this part of the dashboard came into play. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna go down a little bit. There, there's a few different aspects to, to the dashboard here. And one of the other big questions that we had was, what's gonna, what is the photo upload experience going to be like for people out in the field? We knew that they're, they're not gonna be on Wi-Fi, they're just gonna be on cell networks, right? They're out in somebody else's property taking photos and doing this like rich content upload. So we put in instrumentation of, like, of the photo upload process and, and so we could keep an eye on average how long are these photos taking to upload because that's directly correlates to the user experience, right? And unfortunately, what you can't see in this graph now because time has gone on, but at one point in time, it was much, much worse. And the reason for that was we did no client side compression or downsizing of the image. We were just like, whatever the device gave us, we were shoving up to the server and on like, you know, if you're in some apartment building, you might be on 3G or something. And so we had the instrumentation in place to watch like, what is the photo upload experience like? And we iterated on that over time. So we did things like background loading the images and I, Unfortunately, at one point in time, this dashboard sort of showed that, and we had experiments in play with different options. Now it's kind of settled down, but I, hopefully you can kind of see how, how the analytics were like so instrumental in, in the development of this product. Um, okay, so another piece here. So we, we decided to build this um, for web first before going like to, going native. And the reason for that, there's kind of two aspects to the inspections process. One is the person in the field doing the inspection, and then the other part is the person in the back office reviewing it and like uh, doing follow-up work, like getting maintenance people lined up to paint or fix toilets or whatever. Um, and so we were hoping we could just build one, one responsive version for web that could meet both needs. Um, and so that was, you know, uh, that was our hypothesis going in. And so we built, we had the analytics in place to answer that question too. So we, we launched with just web and we were keeping a close eye on like, okay, what, uh, what OSs are being used primarily for like creating these inspections versus um, just looking at them and things like that. So we could tell like, is this, is it gonna work with just web or do we need to go deeper? Um, and then along those lines, when you're building for web, as anybody who builds for web knows, you, browser support, OS support is like just part and parcel of the game. And you gotta, you gotta know who's using what and which browsers are, you can retire and stop testing with, right? So we had all those analytics in place. And actually, there, there were some interesting pieces um, like uh, on this graph here that shows iOS versions over time. Um, when, we, when we first launched, there was a bug in, I think it was iOS 8, where if you put um, on a file input type, if you put, if you used multiple, what it would do is it would prevent you from actually taking a photo on the spot. It would force you to use the camera roll, right? Which is kind of no good. So we decided it'd be better to like leave off the multiple fo photo upload thing um, and let people kind of take the photos of, of items in the apartment as they're going versus the, the other experience. But then we needed to keep track of when iOS 8 fell off, we're optimistic that it would be fixed. And sure enough, it was fixed in iOS 9. So somewhere, you know, in, 
though I guess it fell off earlier than this, but whatever. You can see what I'm saying. So when it got to low enough usage, we made the call and we said, okay, now let's enable multiple file uploads for, for iOS 8. So things like that, was, you know, it's really powerful to, to use these, these dashboards to answer those questions. Um, this is also really useful for our quality assurance teams that maintain the, the browser compatibility lists. And, you know, we, we have automated tests that use um, certain platforms where you can say which browsers and versions and devices you want to test on. And we don't want to spend money if we don't have to, so we need to kind of keep on top of what needs to be tested in, in the automated environments as well. Um, okay, so let's go down a little bit more. So, oh, this, the, the image upload funnel here, so it's kind of out of place, but I was having trouble moving things around on the dashboard, so it is where it is. This image upload funnel, so I mentioned previously when we, when we first launched, we were doing no like client side uh, down, down sampling or resizing of the images, just like shipping them full frame. Well, when we, when we made the change to uh, compress and resize things, that was all done in JavaScript. And it's pretty, you know, it's pretty memory intensive operations. And in the browser, you have, you, you have no way of knowing like, how much else they have going on. Like their phone might be totally loaded down and the browser might be about to get killed off by the OS, you know, out of memory. So we, we wanted to keep a really close eye on like the really nitty gritty photo upload experience like through this, this funnel of the upload process. And so we have like custom analytics at like each step in our JavaScript code where it's doing this, this client side resampling so that we can keep an eye on like the success rates of uploading these photos. And that was, that was hugely helpful because without this, you know, anecdotally, you have a few noisy customers who are like, it always crashes, it never works, right? And you go, geez, is this representative of, of the whole? But with something like this, you look at it and you go like, you know what, like on average across all devices, all customers, all connectivity, it's working well, right? Um, I think that pretty much wraps it up with this dashboard, and I'd be happy to answer any questions afterward and, and talk more. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. That was amazing. Okay, next up we're going to have Bill Sammons from Dow Jones. You may have heard him earlier. Didn't you speak yesterday, my friend? Oh, later on, oh, later on today, so don't miss him. He's um, got some amazing things. He's director of content develop enrichment, and I have no idea what that means, so we're all going to figure that out together. All right, let's get you hooked up here, Bill. Right there. All right, let's welcome Bill. Let me just get out of here. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, um, I'm Bill Simmons, uh, uh, head of content in Richmond Dow Jones. Um, and what that really means, oh, this one? This one? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, head of uh, content in Richmond Dow Jones. Thank you. All right, one more time. Uh, so I'm Bill Simmons from Dow Jones, uh, head of content enrichment. Um, people don't know what that means. Uh, what it means basically is that I uh, run all the systems and uh, services that add um, annotations to data um, for our products like Factiva. Uh, so we get a lot of data that comes into our, pro uh, our pipeline every day, about two million documents a day, and we're we have about a dozen or 15 annotators that we need to run against every one of those documents to try to figure out the best metadata to put on the, on the, uh, the documents so our customers can find um, the results with high fidelity. 
Um, so, you know, most of my systems have no front end. There's no browser access to them. There's no um, users directly of the, of the system. So, um, so you might scratch your head and say, well, how am I using, how am I going to use something like Insights for this? Um, and, and the bottom line is it's actually not that hard, right? You got you to think about your data, um, which is easy to say, and, and I think that's, uh, it's, a, it's a simple thing saying think about your data, but um, it's hard, actually. When you get the right data, the right attributes, and everything sending up to New Relic Insights, um, it's hard. And I think one of the great things about New Relic Insights is um, you can try it, make a mistake, try it again, make a mistake, try it again, make a mistake. It's so fast to be able to do this kind of stuff that, you know, that's the best way to get the most useful information up and most useful dashboards in, in our experience. So, um, so I just wanted to show you this one here. Uh, this is one of our dashboards that, that I use primarily. And in my line of business, what I'm really worried about every day is, you know, how fast are we doing this? You know, two million documents a day, 15 annotators, they're doing some really hard things like reading text and trying to figure out um, what subject the thing is about or what industries or what regions, which people are in it, which company is a whole slew of things, which is actually not that easy to do. So we gotta be very sensitive to, um, to the delays and how long it can take. So, so this is a dashboard I use all the time and it's, uh, I made it for me, uh, but basically what it allows me to do is quickly go through um, the performance of my system over a long period of time. All right, and I can use each one of these things to kind of drill down through the different environments. So I'm worried about our integration staging and production systems. I don't worry too much about our integration systems, but sometimes it's interesting to, to peek into it. But our staging systems, we do get pretty interested in. When we run an update to our system, we want to make sure the staging system is performing well before we move it to production. Um, the, the cost of doing this badly is to, to need to scale up, right, to have more resources available to do the same job. So that's why we, we pay a lot of attention to it. So, so this one basically gives me a, 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 a facet of the environments. So I can just basically quick through, quickly go through which environment I'm interested in today. So I'm interested in production. I use a lot of data. This happens when you have a lot of data. Um, so uh, one of the first things I can see is, you know, for this is this uh, over the past 180 days, um, all the different releases that we've actually moved into production and what the performance characteristics are. Um, so if I look here, this uh, total orchestration dwell time, total orchestration dwell time, that's what you were interested in. Right? Um, uh, this is uh, a thing of beauty for me, right? If I, if I look at this chart and I look back over 180 days and I see this steady downward uh, trajectory of our releases, um, that means we're doing our job really, really well. That means I need less resources to do the job. All right, so while the, 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 uh, the, the y-axis here is in milliseconds, it's a trillion dollars, all right? When, when I know I can do this, I can use less resources to do the same job in the same amount of time. If I can reduce the dwell time, I can reduce the number of servers. If the dwell time goes up, I need more servers, okay? Um, so let me just jump down here. So this is a little bit more detail. Um, I talked about annotators. We have uh, a whole bunch of them, and some of them are captured here. Uh, so I can see here also at each annotator, uh, what the, the average dwell times are um, for each one of those things. And then I have it broken down by, by language. We have 28 languages that we process. Um, and different languages and different technologies will perform at different rates, uh, depending on what it is. Something might perform very well in English, not so well in Chinese. So I can see this here as well, and I can see the averages that are going on. And I can kind of get an idea that if there's anything specifically jumps out at me. Uh, I can always look at the long poles, like the... You know, the long pole here of the, the, the autocoder and the, and the dot cluster. Um, over time, you kind of get used to knowing what you expect. See something out of line there, it can, it can jump out at you. Uh, but I can also filter, right? So I can do this because everything here is a, is a facet. I can basically zero in on the German content. And if I go back up to the top, it's going to redraw my content, my, uh, my dashboards with just the, just the German content. So I can see here if there's something, you can take a look over here saying, well, German content dwell time went up a little bit in the last release. Uh, we can then take that on the side and say, why? You know, what's, what's, is that really bad or did we add some new feature that calls for that dwell time increase? Okay. Um, so let me jump over to a different but similar one. 
Um, again, this is something that we use in technology. Um, similar kind of things here. We've got it kind of broken down the orchestration by, by, uh, by language, and you can kind of see there you know, Portuguese had some kind of spike back in last week sometime. Um, but if I come down here, uh, what we've also done is to create some very interesting histograms um, of the individual uh, at the, the combined services, which is the MPC dwell time, and then the, uh, the autocoder. So here I can see um, dwell time in different ratios. I can see it you know, here against the size of a document. Right? So we have very different sized documents. We get anything from a, 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 a tweet or, or something like that to you know, very large documents, millions of uh, bytes. Um, and you can see here if there's something going on you know, where for some reason things are slowing down based on um, where the, the density is in the data. So here is, I'm always looking for these little dark blue boxes to be up in that upper left-hand corner. Uh, if it's up in that upper left-hand corner, that means most of our data is working really, really fast. Uh, if I come over here and I see something odd, you know, this one's a little bit higher, you know, I may have to look into what's going on in that area. But the, 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 the biggest thing would be something where right in the middle here somewhere you saw some big spike and said, why would that piece of data, um, that piece of content be slowed down? Um, I can also do it and look at um, by, by system. Let me, let me filter back into production again. Yep, there we go. So here I can see again, by size, I talked about size, and here's by language, right? I can see if there's something going on specifically by language. Here I can see it by, by host name, right? The actual hosts that are running these things. If for some reason one host doesn't have a, the same pattern as the others and I'm doing low balancing, something may be wrong with that server, okay? And we do that across a whole slew of things from the, the total dwell time to the autocoder and, and a whole bunch of different annotators. Um, Am I doing on time, okay? Okay. Um, one other thing that I'd like to show you we did here, this, um, this group here, the Essex Region Dwell Time, current week, prior week, and two weeks ago, um, this is a little bit different here, what we're looking at here. So this is a uh, annotator that is configured by a data strategy team. And they're always tweaking the, the, the configuration of this every week. And it's a new tool for us, so we're, again, they're hyper-focused on making sure the functionality is working when they tweak the, the configuration. I'm hyper-focused on making sure the performance is not going to kill our systems. Um, so here I put together this thing where I can basically look at the profile of the configuration from this week to last week to two weeks ago. And if I see an odd pattern across these three dash, these uh, panes, I can say, hey, we've got something going on and I can even potentially drill and, and find whether it's the German one or the, the Russian one or something along those lines. Okay, um, I'll go one more if I got time. All right, so this one's a little bit different. Um, this is a dashboard and, and again, I, I love, the thing I love about New Relic Insights is it's so fast, right? It's so fast to create them, play with them, change them. This did not exist two weeks ago, okay, this dashboard. Neither, neither did the data. Um, our, our data strategy team um, came up with a problem as they're trying to move to this new annotator um, for uh, classification that they didn't realize they were going to run up against. And what it was is that some of the codes that we generate were crowding out other codes. Um, so we wanted to find out, you know, why was that happening? Which codes were crowding out other codes? Um, and is it correct or is it not correct? You know, they started seeing a problem and saying, well, you know what, I didn't see the Russian code come up on as much content as I expected it to be. You know, why is it getting pushed out? So we've created this uh, dashboard, which we call you know, loser codes or, or bully codes. Um, and it allows them to basically come in here and look at, um, again, they can filter into you know, a couple of days ago data um, to kind of focus in a little bit. Um, they can come in here and hit the, the code Russia right, as a loser code. And then see what, what other codes are pushing it out more than other, other codes. So here, SP City, which I'm not sure what SP City stands for, um, 520 times on that day it pushed out the Russia code. All right, pushed out the Russia code. Um, now here's the really cool one. Uh, we can actually go in here and click on SP City as well. So I've drilled down to Tuesday's data, Russia loser, SP City winner, and then here are the stories. All right, so here are the actual stories that have gone through the system that. Uh, that where, where, so they can then go look up these stories in our data and say, 
let me look at it. Is it right or is it wrong? It might be right that SP City pushed Russia out 540 times on that debt, uh, but they can then drill through here. And what we try to do is um, use the highest loser score. So this is a, the most, the, the top stories here are the ones that most likely should have gotten the Russia code, uh, but didn't because of SP City. Um, one quick thing I'll show you, because I think it's pretty cool. We do this trick um, where this is a discrete um, record in, in, uh, in New Relic Insights, um, yet I have the ability to drill through to it. Okay, so what we've done here is we've actually put a facet on a piece of data that there's only ever one thing of. Okay, but by doing that, it allows me to actually pull out the specific information for a loser score in Russia, um, the accession number, the, the headline, so I can actually see all that discrete data by doing a trick using the, uh, the functions like latest and average. And if you do the latest or average on one item, what do you get? You get that item, right? Um, and that allows me to then click on this one and then see other information. I can use that as a facet. So it's, it's, uh, it's a great tool. All right, thank you.